Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Indiana is not expanding vaccine eligibility as quickly as neighboring states, and the health department is placing the blame on the federal government. Whether we have vaccine available to everyone who is eligible, though, depends on our supply of vaccine. Ahead, a look at how far the state is lagging behind and whether it'll be able to open up eligibility to everyone by May 1st. Legislation making its way through the state house would make it easier to send convicted juveniles to adult prisons. I don't think it's making this world safer by using this direct file concept and pushing these kids directly into adult court without taking a look at the individual circumstance of each case. And we take a look at how food delivery services are cashing in during the pandemic, but often at the expense of local restaurants. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from around the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Well, Indiana has begun to lag behind other states in getting people vaccinated for COVID-19. And officials say that's in part because the state isn't getting as many doses. The state did lower the minimum age to get the vaccine to 45 this week, but some neighboring states have opened eligibility to all adults. Now, Indiana Health Commissioner Chris Bach says the state hopes to open eligibility to all Hoosiers by May 1st, the target date of the Biden administration. Whether we have vaccine available to everyone who is eligible, though, depends on our supply of vaccine. According to the CDC, only six states have received fewer doses per 100,000 people than Indiana. The state's population ranks 17th in the nation. Bach says the state is expecting larger amounts of the vaccine from the federal government late this month and into early April. Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb will deliver an address Tuesday charting the state's path out of the pandemic. Legislation making its way through the General Assembly could make it easier for juvenile offenders to end up serving time in adult prisons. Adam Pinsker spoke with some advocates trying to change the legislation. Here's his report. 17-year-old Jeremy Perez of Indianapolis admits he isn't perfect. I've been caught up in the system a couple of times, but besides that, uh, really I'm a hardworking, hands-on person. Perez is one of many teens referred by the court system to Voices, a community outreach organization in Indianapolis. The day reporting program allows students to complete their schoolwork, earn a GED, and build life skills. Since we have started day reporting, We've served almost 400 students, and two-thirds of them had a gun charge. Voices Director Brandon Randall is worried about House Bill 1369, which repeals a law requiring people to obtain a permit in order to carry a handgun in Indiana. It would create a new crime for minors caught carrying a gun. Their offense would be called unlawful possession, and uh, it's a, for the most part, it's a Class A misdemeanor to begin with, but there are some... Uh, factors which raise it to a level five felony. Joel Wenicky with the Indiana Public Defender Council says exceptions for possessing a handgun at home or at a firing range aren't carved out in the new bill. That can mean jail time for minors caught carrying a handgun. Some of these children are living in the exact same neighborhoods they are, you know, dealing with very concerning uh, circumstances and they feel like they're not being protected by the adults in their neighborhood and sometimes will resort to accessing firearms in order to protect themselves. Wanneke is also worried about another bill the legislature is debating that will require certain crimes juveniles are charged with be automatically tried in adult court. 
One provision extends the statute of limitations on child molestation. A child who may have committed a crime at the age of 14 could be charged in adult court after he or she turns 18. Well, a 14-year-old boy and a 13-year-old girlfriend and that's the dividing line for child molest is the age between 13 and 14. So that 14 year old boy and the 13 year old girlfriend engage in conduct that would be fondly. Wanaki understands lawmakers are trying to look out for the best interests of children, but says the proposed legislation cast a wide net that could pose unintentional consequences. But the reality is, I don't think it's making this world safer by using this direct file concept and pushing these kids directly into adult court without taking a look at the individual circumstance of each case. Wanaki and Randall agree that allowing more juvenile crimes to be directly filed into adult court will hurt black and brown youth more than their white counterparts. In late 2019, the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute surveyed 139 juveniles under adult court supervision. 112 of them were direct file cases and 27 were waived meaning a juvenile court passed the case along to an adult court. Black juveniles comprised 66% of direct file cases compared to 29% of white defendants. Black juveniles also made up 70% of the waivers to adult court compared to 19% of white defendants. The criminal justice system and even other systems like education, these systems were built to benefit white people. They were not, ben they were not created to benefit people of color. Randall worries if the legislature passes laws that allow more juvenile crimes to be tried in adult court, it would prevent kids like Perez from completing the Voices Diversion Program. If laws like this were to have been passed, he wouldn't have been with us. He wouldn't have gotten his GED. He wouldn't have been able to be, um, you know, successful in a variety of ways. Perez says he's pursuing a career in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning industry while speaking to kids younger than him about his experiences in the system. Tell them, like, you don't want to be in a position, like a messed up position with the system or anything. You still got a lot of growing to do. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. The Indiana Democratic Party will choose a new state chair Saturday as current head John Zodi steps down after eight years at the helm. Indiana Public Broadcasting's Brandon Smith reports on what exactly the state chair of a political party is responsible for. Political scientist Laura Wilson says state party chair is a difficult but vital position. Most people experience their influence primarily through elections. State party chairs help identify and recruit candidates, and Wilson says they also direct money. You only have so many resources, so where that money goes, even in terms of where the talent, where, where you're encouraging people to hire in certain ways, right? they're, they're influential in the organization of campaigns themselves. Wilson says becoming the new chair of Indiana Democrats will bring both great pressure and opportunity for a party that is struggling to maintain relevance statewide. They need to be able to provide a new focus, most likely. A lot of the messaging that the Democratic candidates have had recently hasn't been resonating with Hoosier voters. They need to work on that, uh, probably also mobilizing people and motivating them. There are two candidates for state Dem chair, Mike Schmuel and Tom Wallace. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Brandon Smith at the State House. Indiana legislative leaders say they want to end the 2021 session more than a week early, and they plan on moving up their deadlines to do so. The General Assembly has until April 29th to finish its work, but Senate President Pro Tem Roderick Bray says lawmakers hope to wrap up by April 21st. You know, it's um, it's more efficient, saves the state money if we're not here the uh, uh, a week. And um, just generally speaking, if we get our business done, I think we uh, we get back home, and most Hoosiers would appreciate that. Lawmakers often try to end session early, but they almost never move up other deadlines to do so. Lawmakers must still pass a new state budget and likely decide how to spend three billion dollars in new federal COVID-19 relief funds. Well, it's March Madness in Indiana and high school boys basketball enters semi-state play this weekend. While many facilities are taking the proper precautions, some health officials are worried these large crowds packing high school gyms could pose risks for reigniting an outbreak. Brock Turner has more. Images of celebrations and crowds like these in high school gyms across Indiana were commonplace pre-pandemic, but now they're a cause for concern. 
While Indiana's COVID-19 positivity rate and hospitalizations are at their lowest levels in months, public health officials are still sounding alarms about large crowds gathering for basketball. I get it. It's March Madness. This is Indiana. But, you know, we got to get through another, se another season of basketball before we can really kind of let our guards down. While the state is hosting 68 teams for the NCAA men's tournament, restrictions, daily testing, and strict capacity limits are expected to limit possible transmission. But most high school basketball teams don't have those luxuries. Last year, high school basketball was the source of multiple super spreader events. Each requires pre-approval from local health departments, but officials have little way to enforce plans once they're approved. We're just not able to um, for the amount of staff that we have. Uh, we do rely on those to follow the rules and do what they're supposed to do uh, for the mitigation and to uh, make sure that they are enforcing it on their side. North Davies High School did not respond to multiple requests for comment on their plans and enforcement strategies after images on social media showed nearly full stadiums with few people wearing masks. But other schools are being more transparent and socially distant. Seymour High School's Lloyd E. Scott Gymnasium is one of the largest in the country and has been hosting IHSAA tournament games for decades. Our main mission as the host is, is to make sure that those teams, we do what we can to ensure their safety as far as uh, moving on to the next week. Athletic Director Kirk Manns says they're limiting celebrations and cleaning the venue in between games. Manns credits the custodial staff, volunteers, and partnerships with local health officials. While his venue is allowed to operate at half capacity, which is about 4,000 spectators, that many haven't shown up to any event thus far, and he expects that will be the case this weekend as well. And we're not getting to half capacity right now because I just, I believe that people are not ready to come out yet for whatever reason that is. And uh, so it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, to, for, for folks to gain that trust back and, and to want to come out and to be in a crowd. Hans says most spectators are compliant, but he says each school is responsible for its own student section. While the atmosphere is different this year, he insists the level of play is still the same, as well as the coaching and attention to detail, all of which are hallmarks of Indiana high school basketball. The uh, casual spectator right now. Uh, a lot of them are making the decision, not yet for me. And, uh, you know, as we move through this and we move into hopefully by this time next year, you know, uh, Lloyd E. Scott Gymnasium is, is on the brink of capacity again for the state tournaments. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. The mill in Bloomington has launched a new program aimed at helping develop business skills for formerly incarcerated persons. And during the pandemic, food delivery services are cashing in, but often at the expense of local restaurants. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Wake up. Wake up to the world. To the marvels. The mayhem. The music. Wake up to the wows. The woes. The wonder. Wake up to the commotion. To the beauty. To the humanity. To the hope. Wake up every morning, fully awake. NPR Morning Edition. Tune in to your local station or download the NPR app. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders has seen a significant increase since the beginning of the pandemic last year. Sarah Whitmire has this report. In January 2020, COVID-19 wasn't an issue on most Americans' minds, but Indiana University history professor Ellen Wu says she had a feeling that something that could endanger the Asian American community beyond just a virus was coming. I remember talking to my friends, you know, last Lunar New Year and, and telling them I, you know, I just had a really bad feeling based on what I know, you know, about U.S. history that um, bad things were going to happen to um, Asian folks, Asian Americans. 
New data shows that hate crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in 16 large American cities surged nearly 150 percent last year alone. Wu is a member of the Indiana chapter of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, an organization which just last week sent a petition to Governor Eric Holcomb asking for an official recognition and condemnation of racism against Asian Americans. Representative J.D. Ford signed on to the letter, and he authored Senate Resolution 29, which is an official denouncement of racism against Asian Americans and bias crimes resulting from COVID-19 in Indiana. We have heard um, national leaders, um, you know, uh, say things like, you know, the China virus or Kung flu or things of that nature. And, and that is very triggering to a lot of people, uh, particularly, um, you know, our, our Asian Americans uh, and Pacific Islanders. The governor, for his part, says racism and anti-Asian discrimination has no place in Indiana. It's up to each and every one of us to be a role model and to, to um, be able to, with open arms, say, uh, welcome to Indiana, grow your family, grow your business, grow your lives here. Indiana University, Butler University, and the city of Bloomington also signed on to the petition, which Wu says is a good first step. Having any kind of um, major institution, even begin to take these steps to recognize that this is, these are issues worth addressing, um, that, that in and of itself is significant. According to the U.S. Census, about 2.7 percent of Hoosiers are Asian or Pacific Islander. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. The coronavirus pandemic more than doubled business for many food delivery apps, but ordering from your phone might not be helping your favorite restaurant as much as you think. Mitch Legan reports. A global pandemic wasn't on Chris Francis's radar when he signed his lease at 208 South Dunn. After running a catering service in Bloomington for years, he was ready to open a restaurant in early 2020. But about two weeks after Francis signed the lease, the restaurant industry was flipped upside down. We were dead in the water. Um, and it took a few months <laughs> of paying, still paying rent and all the utilities and everything, but not making any money off of it. And it came to a point to where we had to decide, okay, do we just bite the bullet and not do it or do we move forward? He had to figure out how to get his food out to the public when many didn't want to come inside. And it didn't help that Francis is the only employee. You're doing everything. You're the cook, you answer the phones, you're the hostess. He didn't have the funds or manpower to deliver food. And when he started researching delivery options, they didn't make sense for a business his size. As a local access show, we want everyone to support local restaurants. But we'd never manipulate you the way all these other commercials do. National third-party delivery services like Uber Eats and DoorDash create a conundrum for many small restaurants. They have the name identification and ability to deliver food, but partnering with them is expensive. Contracts send up to 30% of each sale to the delivery service, not your favorite eatery. Reading through all the contracts and talking to these people when they would say 30% or 27%, it, the first aspect of my mind and the first thought I had was, there's no way. And some of the tactics the companies use rub some the wrong way. Mark Miller became owner of D'Angelo's Italian restaurant two years ago and was confused when he started getting calls from drivers taking the food to go. First thought, you're like, okay, well, it's a, it's a sale. Okay, we'll take it. Um, you know, we need the business just like anybody else. But after a couple months, the call stopped coming in. Start getting emails, phone calls. Hey, this is, you know, DoorDash. Did you like having all the business that we sent your way? How about signing up? It's like signing up. Like, why? I mean, you were sending orders my way to begin with. Why do I need to sign up for something now? At the same time, the services provide a quick buck for people like Caitlin Holt. So when the pandemic hit, I needed something to supplement my income at my full-time job. So I went ahead and looked into DoorDash because you can make your own hours and that kind of stuff. The services have increased in popularity during the pandemic. And especially in a college town like Bloomington, with its young tech-savvy population, they're here to stay. We're creatures of or habit. It's easier for me to grab my cell phone, grab my computer, order food, 
and not have to leave my house. Francis says at best, he'll break even with the delivery services. He's hoping the changing weather and increasing vaccines will lead people to choose getting back to the experience of eating out over the convenience of delivery. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. Well, the mill in Bloomington launched a new entrepreneurial program last month for the formerly incarcerated. Holden Abshir reports. Reboot is a six-week program designed to help participants focus their business ideas and work to fill customer needs. Andy Lehman is head of Accelerator Programming at The Mill, a nonprofit center for entrepreneurship located in the repurposed Showers Brothers Furniture Company Dimension Mill. He says Reboot is designed to open the door for an underserved population. A lot of folks don't get told yes. Like they're constantly told no uh, and don't have opportunities that other folks do. I wanted this to be an opportunity to say yes um, and give folks the opportunity to, to, to build something. At the end of the program, participants become members of the mill for a year. They'll have more opportunities to grow and expand their business through programs and partnerships. One of the first seven participants is Michelle Brecky, a house painter from Bloomington. For her, the program is not just business, it's personal. I made myself a promise when I was in prison that um, I wouldn't turn down any help that was offered to me. And that was like, I'm an addict, so in the recovery thing, but also in like my life. Brecky used to ask her boss for a raise almost every Friday, but was rarely successful. She would jokingly tell him, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. Brecky eventually left the company, opened Big Deal Painting in October 2019, and gave herself the raise she always wanted. She says being a part of the Reboot program has not only expanded her company, but also given her a new sense of confidence. She says she finally feels like a big deal. To, to see the progress from week to week, to know that like what we're doing um, is resonating and everybody's getting things out of it is, 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 is amazing. Layman says the program has already received a lot of support, including several guest speakers. With two weeks left in the first group of participants, Layman anticipates an expanded program in the fall. For more information, visit dimensionmill.org. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Holden Apsher. The Environmental Protection Agency has come up with a plan to clean up toxic PCE and TCE in Martinsville, the same chemical suspected of causing rare childhood cancers in Franklin. As Indiana Public Broadcasting's Rebecca Thiel reports, one local resident and activist says the EPA needs to act more quickly. The EPA plans to inject chemicals into the groundwater to break down the PCE and TCE. It also hopes to address toxic vapors from the soil that could be seeping into homes and businesses. Tom Wallace is a retired environmental engineer and the founder of the Martinsville, Indiana Superfund Site Association. He says the EPA's water cleanup plan is close to what the city and its residents wanted, but he'd prefer something quicker and hopes the agency will keep an open mind. It is effective, but it's longer term. We're talking 17 to 30 years in many cases. And uh, looking at some of the Plume Stop things, they've done it in two years or less on some. Plume Stop is what's being used to clean Franklin's groundwater. Wallace says an entire generation in Martinsville has been exposed to these harmful chemicals. His group is working with Purdue University researchers to study how exposure to PCE specifically might be affecting the city's children. There are at least three other areas of groundwater pollution in Martinsville. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Rebecca Thiel. Indiana University is searching for a new men's basketball coach after it fired Archie Miller earlier this week. Pat Bean reports. The five NCAA championship banners hanging in Simon Scott Assembly Hall are reminders of the expectations of winning basketball at Indiana. Archie Miller simply wasn't doing enough of that for the Hoosiers. It's a results-oriented business, and, and I, I really felt that ultimately we had not made enough progress uh, to continue the program and, and under Archie's, Archie's leadership. Miller had a 67-58 and 58 record overall, and the Hoosiers failed to make the NCAA tournament in any of his four seasons. Indiana never finished higher than a tie for six in the Big Ten under Miller, and that came in his first season in 2018. Indiana finished tied for 10th in the Big Ten the past two seasons. Dolson said Miller's $10.3 million buyout was not paid by the university. One anonymous donor covered the entire cost of the buyout, and another donor agreed to cover the cost of the transition to find a new coach. Dolson said the head coaching position at Indiana should be an enviable one. 
you've got elite facilities, you know, elite level fan support, you've got, uh, you know, elite tradition. And, and I think it's, it's, it's really a, just a tremendous opportunity to really take this program uh, to the level we all want to. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Pat Bean. Now, Indiana isn't playing in the NCAA tournament, but Assembly Hall is playing host to six early round games this week. Assembly Hall is one of six venues being used for this year's tournament, which will be played entirely in Indiana due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Some venues are allowing up to 25% capacity for fans, but IU limited its crowds to no more than 500 family members and friends of players and staff. The final will be played at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. And Indiana State named Joss Schertz its new men's basketball coach this week. Schertz was a four-time NCAA Division II National Coach of the Year at Lincoln Memorial. He succeeds Greg Lansing, who was let go last week. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.